Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club of Portland. Welcome to all our club members and our many distinguished guests. I'd like to acknowledge Mayor Vera Katz, who's here, as well as Commissioner Saltzman. I believe Commissioner Randy Leonard was, was here, and certainly Serena Cruz, Multnomah County Commissioner, is here. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to our listening audience as well. Today's Friday Forum is about the future of our regional utility, Portland General Electric. But before we begin our program, I have a few items of City Club business. Next Friday, March 19th, City Club asks, what's to eat? Uh, we're going to have state, vet state veterinarian Dr. Andrew Clark and rancher Jack Southworth, who will speak about the recent mad cow disease scare, its effect on the beef industry, and what's being done to protect our food supply. You can register to today online at uh, www.pdxcityclub.org or uh, call the City Club office. City Club could hardly be more timely when on March uh, 17th, Wednesday, we present a special moderated panel discussion on marriage. The title is Marriage, the State of the Union. And we'll take a step back from the polarized rhetoric that's surrounding the issue these days to reassess an ever-changing institution from a number of perspectives. This forum was originally scheduled to take place at Multnomah County Commissioner's boardroom, but in order to provide a more neutral venue, <laughs> as well as to accommodate a larger audience, we expect, City Club has moved, to the marriage, uh, moved the marriage forum to the theater at 2 World Trade Center, the PG World Trade Center. Get all the details from uh, our website or from the bulletin, which is available here today. Our City Club spring membership drive continues, and we've been giving away prizes each week to new members. So if you join City Club today, we'll throw your name into a drawing for an autographed copy of Jewel Lansing's book, Portland, People, Politics, and Power, 1851 to 2001. You'll find membership brochures on each table, and you can sign up for automatic monthly withdrawals from your checking account for the fee, for the uh, uh, annual membership fee. So join City Club today, and you could walk away with a new and fascinating book. Speaking of Jewel Lansing, her book about Portland happens to be the very book that our book club, Citizens Read, will be discussing at our next meeting. Mike Burton will moderate a discussion of Portland's history on Monday, March 29th at the Zimmerman Community Center in the Pearl District. The book club is open and uh, is free and open to the public, and we have copies of the book available for sale uh, outside the entrance here. I'd like to introduce two new members today and ask that they stand. Russ Urquhart and Mary Ellen Page Farr. Are you both here? There they are. Welcome. Glad you joined City Club. The broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente, Pope and Talbot Inc., and Shorebank Pacific. We're very grateful for their support. So on to our program. Our regional utility, Portland General Electric, has been part of our community for 114 years. Over the last seven years or so, however, the saga of, of PGE has provided more drama than virtually any other issue in our civic life, life maybe until last week. Um, in, 19, in 1997, Enron purchased PGE with promises of increased efficiencies, access to world-class fuel management and energy trading, and lower rates. From Enron's perspective, apparently, the bloom was quickly lost from the rose. By 2003, Enron had made two failed attempts to sell PGE. The efforts to sell PGE were soon overtaken by the reality of Enron's bankruptcy. As Enron worked its way through bankruptcy court proceedings, various parties in Portland and elsewhere organized around various alternatives for PGE's future. Over the last three years, options under discussion have included the formation of a public utility district that that would acquire or condemn some of PGE's assets, a customer-led proposal to acquire the utility, the city's own attempt to acquire PGE, and the potential that PGE stock would simply be distributed to, to creditors. In November, the announcement of PGE's sale to the Oregon Electric Utility Company slash Texas Pacific Group brought on a new set of questions. However, at this point, the only issue currently on the Portland table, at least, is whether and how the Oregon Public Utilities Commission should approve TB TPG's acquisition of PGE. Our speakers today bring two very different perspectives about the future of PGE. Tom Walsh speaks to us as a partner in the Oregon Electric Utility Company, while Eric Sten, more than anyone else on the Portland City Council, with the possible exception of our mayor, uh, has been at the heart of Portland's efforts to acquire PGE. 
Eric needs a little, in little introduction to this audience. A native of Portland, Eric has been elected to the City Council three times. His current term will expire in December 2006. As a Portland City Commissioner, Eric is currently directly responsible for the day-to-day -day management of Portland's Bureau of Fire, Rescue and Emergency Services, and the Bureau of Housing and Community Development. He, he also has special assignments to direct Portland's programs on energy policy, global warming, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, and the Endangered Species Act. I was so taken by the couple paragraphs Tom Walsh sent, sent us as his biographical uh, background information that I'm going to do what I rarely do, which is to read the speaker's self-provided information verbatim, if a bit abbreviated. So Tom writes, no, no, no. <laughs> Tom writes, Portland adopted the Walsh family 50 years ago, educated all of us in its public schools, and has afforded me and my brother Bob the opportunity to be builders of affordable housing since 1960. During this half century, I've taken brief sojourns to the engineering school at Stanford to be a city council candidate and to serve as general manager of TriMet. Of more delight has been the opportunity to serve on boards and commissions as unconnected as Neighborhood House, the Oregon Historical Society, the Oregon Transportation Commission, LCDC, the Board of Forestry, the Central City Plan, and the God Squad for the Spotted Owl. I currently serve with Ogden Beeman on the Mount Tabor Reservoir Panel, uh, Reservoir Review Panel. So Tom will go first, and then Eric will follow him in this discussion today. Thank you. Andy, thank you. If I knew you were going to do that, I would have actually sent you the latest report from my parole officer. It's <laughs> we'll get that and publicize it for you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the City Club, Commissioner Stennis, my pleasure to join Eric on the platform today, and I want to thank each of you for the opportunity to present one vision for what the possible future of PGE might look like. As Andy mentioned, I'm not a native Portlander. I came here barely 50 years ago. It was in the eighth grade. As many of you who are my generation remember, in the eighth grade, we always took Oregon history, and from that, we learned the Oregon story. Today, if I could, I'll tell you in a short version what the Oregon Electric story might look like, but I think there are some parallels between those two stories. They're about a far-reaching vision, about a focus on fundamentals, a real tenacity for details, they both have pieces of an ethic, a partnership, and most importantly, through both run the acknowledgement that the future always holds some risk. The Oregon Electric story is really pretty simple. Three old guys with deep Oregon roots are invited by a preeminent national investment firm to bring PGE home. Home out of the Enron bankruptcy, out of the Houston razzle-dazzle, out of the tax diversion, out of the criminal price rigging that has wrecked havoc on Western power markets and many, many, many Northwest industries, but to bring PGE back to its roots, a very simple electric utility headquartered in Portland, serving over 750,000 Oregon customers and supplying highly reliable kilowatts to over half of the Oregon economy that prices that are rigorously regulated and usually fair. There's nothing very fancy in that story. It's simply important. You're part of the backbone of this community. You treat your customers extremely well. You work hard. You think ahead. You try to be more reliable than even the rain. You care about the environment. And you earn a profit on which you pay taxes. It's been the Oregon story for almost 200 years. And it's what we at Oregon Electric promise you as part of this future. So who's the we? It's Neil Goldschmidt. Some of you have heard of Neil. Legal aid lawyer, member of the city council, mayor, cabinet secretary, Nike executive, governor of the state of Oregon, consultant, named recently to head the state board of higher education, and most touching to me, the father of a Portland city policeman. He's often controversial. I call him an aging extrovert, but I would make this note. I think he is genuinely and generally underappreciated. Since Tom McCall and Mark Hatfield, nobody has left bigger footprints on this state than Neil Goldschmidt. 
It's also about Jerry Grinstein, somebody only some of you have heard about. Jerry's a Seattle native, CEO of Delta Airlines, chairman of the Board of Regents at the University of Washington, an avowed environmentalist and a longtime friend of Oregon since his days when he served as chief of staff to Senator Warren Magnuson. Senator Magnuson and Senator Hatfield had a rule that they shared when they each in succession ruled the Senate Appropriations Committee. Half of the discretionary money for the Northwest, the other half for the rest of the country. <laughs> Jerry has never forgotten that rule, and for all I know, it's because he may have written it. But I had my first introduction to him over a decade ago when he sat as the chair of the Burlington Northern Railroad, and we had a literally intractable, intractable problem trying to secure the right-of-way to run the West Side Light Rail from Beaverton to Hillsborough. Jerry performed in a way that was, to me, nearly miraculous in securing that right-of-way. And it was a manifestation, if you will, of a person's views, their ethics, their backbone, and their creativity that I have never forgotten. Jerry is simply an unusual, unusual person. And not unimportantly, as my wife might say, Jerry can always bring adult supervision for Neil and Tom. I would close by saying on Jerry, just as a personal note, were he not involved in Oregon Electric, neither would I be. But as the story goes, always, you have to look for the money. And in this case, the money comes from TPG. You will notice I always refer to TPG. I don't like the name Texas Pacific Group. TPG is a, is a marvelous private equity investment term founded 11 years ago by people with West Coast roots who were sort of stranded in Fort Worth. Today it has principal offices in San Francisco, New York, Washington, D.C., and London. It manages over $14 billion of private and public pension funds from throughout the, the country. Most significantly, the state of Oregon, through the PERS fund, has been TPG's largest, most consistent uh, investor over the, the 11 years of their history. If you talk to people on the Oregon Investment Council uh, or at the Treasurer's Office, they give TPG absolutely A-plus marks for competence, for ethics, and for performance. Two individuals from TPG will join us at Oregon Electric. David Bonderman, who is the founder of TPG. He's what I describe as a Warren Buffett and Argyle Sox. He only invests in things that he understands, but he is utterly brilliant at understanding a vast array of terribly complex issues. From his days as a civil rights lawyer to his current efforts in saving the Grand Canyon, David is simply a quiet, thoughtful, and forceful partner. And Kelvin Davis, his partner at TPG, we have almost an Oregonian. Kelvin's father was born and raised in Portland, educated at Washington High School, and is now in his early 70s, uh, the dean of the School of Geology at the University of Southern California. Kelvin used to come to Portland summers, which he spent with his grandparents across from Vestal Grade School. So Kelvin, David, Neil, Jerry, and I are the first uh, members of the board of directors of Oregon Electric. That board will be expanded over the next few months to roughly a dozen people. So a little bit about TPG, the investor partner in Oregon Electric. They bring to the table $1.5 billion of cash with which we will acquire 100% of the stock of PGE. We also assume another just over a billion dollars of existing PGE debt. As required under a law called PUCA, but also reflecting our personal commitment, Neil, Jerry, and I on a personal basis are investors in Oregon Electric. As an aside, just a, a couple of notes on Oregon Electric. It's a holding company that has a single purpose, and that is to acquire and to hold the stock of PGE. It will name the board of directors of PGE, but will do absolutely nothing else. It has no other businesses. It's not a subsidiary of any other company. It owns, it owns no other companies. Uh, it simply has those two responsibilities under its umbrella, which are to acquire that stock and to name the board of PGE. It's an Oregon firm with an Oregon business. It pays taxes in Oregon, and it's committed to its Oregon customers, period, end of chapter. As Andy mentioned, the next steps, most importantly, are a series of federal and state regulatory approvals that are needed if this transaction is to be concluded. 
The most important of those is with our state's Public Utility Commission, and significant examinations will take place before the PUC. They'll examine the entity, Oregon Electric. They'll look at our finances. They'll focus intensively on the current rates and what obligations and responsibilities and commitments we can make about those rates. And they'll also ask very important questions about the long-term ownership and the intentions of Oregon Electric in that regard. At the end of the day, which is expected to be another eight or 10 months, the test that the PUC has to find before they can approve this transaction is, are there net benefits to PGE customers and to the state of Oregon in doing this? Vitally important to that PUC process is the role of interveners. Interveners are individuals, organizations, or entities that want to play a role in shaping the ultimate decision of the PUC. They can advise the PUC in ways to modify the application that we submitted this week, or very frankly, they can strongly urge the PUC to reject that application and to return PGE to the hands of the Enron creditors. The role played by interveners is critical. It shapes the decision for all of us. It finds weaknesses, if any, in our proposal, and ultimately it brings credibility to whatever decision the PUC might reach. Jason Eisendorfer, who many of you know, who's an attorney with CUB, the Citizen Utility uh, Board, said this week, and I strongly agree, if this becomes a case of benefits by platitude, the deal is in deep trouble. Jason is absolutely right and profound on that. The PUC process needs to be about specifics, about details of the transaction. We welcome the rigorous participation of all interveners. In closing, let me make a few personal comments about PGE. Like many of you, I've been a customer of theirs for over four decades. I've worked with their line crews literally since the Columbus Day Storm of 1962 and I've watched and occasionally participated with senior PGE leadership in numerous civic causes over the last 30 years. I want the old PGE back, the one before Trojan, the one before Enron, the one before they were on the for sale block four times in eight years, energy spent wooing suitors rather than focusing on customers. PGE is not a trinket to be offered at auction on an internet it's a treasured community asset critical to our well-being in our homes and our jobs and in our schools. And it's not a faceless company. It's 2,700 dedicated individuals, our friends, our neighbors. They're people who work with Solve, who are readers with SMART, who sit on school boards and community nonprofits throughout the seven counties and 51 communities that make up the service territory of PGE. Bluntly, they've been through hell with Enron. Many have lost substantial portions uh, of their life savings. They're part of us, and we need to be part of their future. They have been led in an extraordinary fashion by a dedicated executive, Peggy Fowler. I couldn't tell you um, in the handful of words that are available today the admiration that I have for Peggy. She is simply fearless. She is quiet. She is modest in victory. She is a rare, rare treasure for this community. At the end of the day, when all is said and done, it's usually that much is said and very little is done. Part of the Oregon Electric story is to change that. Our responsibility, with your help, is to help rebuild a great company, one that understands partnerships, that believes, without exception, you can serve customers, you can serve your communities, you can serve your investors, you can serve your employees, and ultimately, you can serve your regulators with equal honesty and effectiveness. We won't get that done in a day, but we might in a decade. I was genuinely heartened last week when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation made a commitment to become an investor in Oregon Electric. Their commitment speaks volumes literally about the ethics of the Northwest ethics about commitment, about the long term, about the willingness to take risk. If 10 years from now we are judged to have been successful, I predict it will be said that no individual fingerprints could be found on this transaction, that it was a group that cared for their customers and their communities with a passion, and that they built a network of enduring partnerships. 
In some, it will be that they dared to trust and in turn were worthy of being trusted. That's who we are. That's what we'd like to do for Oregon and for PGE. If you'll permit us to do so, we would be ever so pleased. Thank you very much for this opportunity today. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. It, it's, it's an honor, as always, to be here. And it actually is a real honor to share the podium with Tom Walsh, who uh, I think his resume of public service spoke for itself. And it's, he's an amazing community asset. And I'm very, very proud to be up here with him. We're going to disagree today somewhat stridently, but uh, that doesn't take anything away. And this is a tough issue that I'm very glad we're going to debate as a community. Uh, and I would like to, before I really get started, second Tom's comments that he had at the end. And I want to move up in my comments to say that I believe the PGE has been a terrific institution in this community. It has a group of employees who care deeply, and despite all of the things that have been thrown around, and there's been a lot of money spent and a lot of things done, what needs to happen is to keep those employees doing what they do very, very well for this community, and which is crucial, and they are, they are dedicated public servants as well. Uh, I was going to introduce my colleague, Commissioner Dan Saltzman, and my mayor, Mayor Vera Katz, but that's already happened, so what I want to do is thank them for all of their hard work on this issue. It's been difficult, and there hasn't been an easy uh, approach, and at many times, Enron's work has really been to divide this community, and they have stood fast through this, so thank you. Uh, personally, I also want to say hi to my two-month-old son, Nicholas, who the City Club will be glad to know is watching his first television program today, um, if, if in fact he was able to wake up from his morning nap successfully. Um, he doesn't watch TV, but his mother's making an exception this morning. Uh, I believe that the Enron bankruptcy has somewhat ironically brought us an incredible opportunity as a community to do something good for the state. This year ahead of us, as Tom described the timetable, presents us with a chance to meet head on the results of what I think, and I'm going to talk about that today, are very poor federal decisions policy, and we can turn around and do something positive for Oregon. The Oregon Public Utility Commission has an opportunity to demonstrate this year why Oregon is different. The commission can, and they must, cut through the fog of rhetoric that has been surrounding the Enron bankruptcy for so very long. We may very well love dreamers in this state, but right now, we need some principled actors who can make practical decisions. The PUC should deny the Texas Pacific Group's request to purchase Portland General Electric. In the time I have today, I will tell you why I think they should and how we can bring real benefit to Oregon instead. To understand this argument, it just got quiet in here. We, we need to review PGE's history, the role of energy deregulation, and Enron's part in it. The problems that currently face our region are not simply because a few Enron executives were corrupt, though they were. Our problem, which survives the fall of Enron, is that the federal government has set up a framework that rewards financial speculation over long-term stability and the community's best interest. This state of affairs is not in the best interest of our state, and it's not in the best interest of Oregon families and businesses. We should learn from history rather than repeating it. The current wave of corporate scandals is nothing new. To understand what is happening to our community today, I believe we should look back to the time when the term robber barons was coined. They're back and they want to buy our electric company. In the early part of this century, electricity became a critical part of everyday life in America. It quickly became apparent that larger, it began with small companies serving their local communities and quickly larger, more economies of scale were put in place. Once the economies of scales became apparent, and they're still there in the electric industry, major financial speculators of the day began a fight to control those assets. Keep in mind that delivering electricity is a life essential service with very, very little competition. In other words, it is exactly the kind of monopoly system that speculators seek to control. In the late 1920s, J.P. Morgan and his son owned the most successful electric holding company in the U.S., the Electric Bond and Share Company. The Morgans collectively provided 15% of the nation's electricity and about 50% of the, of the electricity in the Northwest at the time. At the same time, a man named Samuel Insull, who was a former aide to Thomas Edison when they were figuring electricity out, was building an electric utility company of his own. Insull quietly gained control of PGE from the local owners through a company called the Portland Electric Power Company, or PEPCO as it was known. PEPCO itself was a product of several holding companies and a fairly elaborate pyramid scheme. Insull was a direct threat to the Morgan family. 
so the Morgans sought to squash him. They attacked Insel's holdings through the stock market and eventually took down his net worth. The battle took its toll, and in 1934, just like Enron today, Pepco went bankrupt. And like Texas Pacific today, J.P. Morgan purchased, PGC, purchased PGE out of the parent company's bankruptcy. Morgan won that battle. Oregonians lost the war. Congress eventually figured out what was, what was obvious by then to Oregonians, which was that the holding company model is good for investors, but terrible for businesses and families in Oregon. In 1935, in response to the fiasco with PGE, Portland General Electric, and similar abuses of the Morgan Company and the insoles, Congress passed the Public Utility Holding Company Act, or PUCA. Under PUCA, it was illegal for companies like J.P. Morgan's to buy a monopoly ut utility. Why was that? It's an irresistible invitation for abuse. Because of this law, which is still on the books today, although the president is working to overturn it, Texas Pacific cannot buy PGE without making extensive disclosures and possibly big div divestments, which is why they have set up the Oregon Electric Utility Company in part. Texas Pacific cannot buy PGE under current law without changing their whole business model, which is why they have to set up a local company. This federal law worked reasonably well for six decades, but in 1992, I believe Congress made a terrible mistake when they deregulated the energy markets. This opened the door to Enron, who bought PGE to showcase how a utility could function in this new deregulated world. And I think we would all agree that Enron did showcase that. Deregulation resulted in fewer choices, higher and more volatile prices, greedy manipulation of markets, mergers, questionable dealings, and less in community involvement across the country by local utilities that had been terrific, like PGE. The executives at, at Enron were dishonest and disingenuous, and in my opinion, they are getting sentenced appropriately, and I hope it continues and goes all the way to the top. Enron took advantage of what is already, I hope and believe, a very different era in approach to corporate governance, and I in no way am insinuating that the board that's in front of you with Mr. Walsh would act in any ma manner remotely like that. If you were simply to look at the last four years, and that is what the Texas Pacific Group is asking you to do, you might very well conclude that the problem we face as a community is Enron. I really wish it were just an issue with Enron and that I could support this approach. History shows us, however, that PGE is just as vulnerable under Texas Pacific's ownership model as it was under Enron's. The very structure of a deregulated, speculative energy market controlled by out-of-state financiers is inherently a system that rewards investors at the cost of our local businesses and families. Enron exploited this system. They exposed its many weaknesses, but they did not create the structure, and we would be unwise to accept on its face that a new buyer will bring public benefit to Oregon by simply not being Enron. Not being Enron is simply not enough. Diminished federal oversight, deregulation, and speculative interest in our utility are the problem. As far as I can tell, none of these basic factors changes under Texas Pacific's ownership. And you don't have to take my word for it, there's a thick proposal that's on the web that spells this out. Like J.P. Morgan and his son 70 years ago, Texas Pacific's holdings are vast, complex, and I've looked hard, they're anything but transparent. In addition to PGE, Morgan's empire included railroads, steel, coal mines, insurance, and communications. And history shows you the lack of regulation allowed him to bilk his customers. The Public Utility Holding Company Act put an end to many of these abuses, but companies like Texas Pacific find ways around the law. In this case, by creating the Oregon Electric Utility com Company so that it, rather than Texas Pacific, is subject to the scrutiny of regulation. It's a new century, but the same shell game. Texas Pacific's business strategy is to purchase the stock through its intermediary, Oregon Electric, cut costs, improve its image, and get the market value up and sell PGE in five to seven years. They've been very explicit about that. They have no incentive to lower rates or to make major investments in the utility. This is how turnaround companies make money for their investors, and Texas Pacific is a turnaround company. They cut costs and they raise rates. The question in front of us is not whether it is a profitable strategy or if there's anything wrong with it. The question is whether or not it is any good for Oregon. 
despite the poor thinking that led to the California energy crisis a few years ago, or a few years ago, I believe Oregon does not need to be a helpless victim in this situation. Oregon law mandates that a utility sale cannot go forward unless there is net benefit to the public. Net benefit is the standard that the PUC must find in order to approve this sale, and is the standard that I am confident our commissioners will, will uphold. Because the statute doesn't clearly define public benefit, it is relatively easy to play rhetorical games with the concept. As I've read the proposal, I believe Texas Pacific has confused public benefit with private benefit. Public benefit is reasonable rates, long-term stability, great customer service, protection of the employees, policies that reflect the values of our community. Public benefit is real, demonstrable, and substantial. While not being Enron is very appealing to me, it is not a public benefit by the law. Not being Enron is simply not enough. PG's rates are among the highest in the Northwest. Texas Pacific has promised that those rates will not be impacted. That's a very nice way of saying they do not intend to lower them. Texas Pacific got a great deal on PGE, and it is possible to reduce rates. If rates are not reduced, Oregonians will miss an opportunity to put almost $1 billion back into our economy, which needs it, over the next few years. We have suffered. This state has suffered through a down economy, and we have watched one headquarter after another bought by out-of-state interests and moved out of town, and we've pointed fingers at each other and tried to figure out which of us is to blame for these global forces. We cannot afford at this point to do it again and give Texas Pacific a windfall profit at the expense of our economy, our businesses, our families. This is the opposite of a public benefit and the opposite of what the law demands. Like many of you, and I agree with Tom, our communities benefited greatly from the energy and expertise of the PGE and PPNL management teams and all of their employees when they were locally owned and operated. They understood what matters to this community and they acted accordingly. Long-term local owners do make decisions that are good for the community and they make investments that pay back over a period of time. They have no other concerns or vested interests. Any proposal that purports to provide public benefit to us must include stable, long-term ownership. What Texas Pacific proposes to do is just the opposite. Nab PGE at a fire sale price, move that price up by maintaining the rates through PR, and unload it in five or so years at the expense of Oregonians. Their business plan is to buy and unload companies. Let's, let, let's move now, I think, from the world of Texas utility finance and talk about what Oregonians could do, in my opinion. Imagine, if you would, a utility that would lower electric rates, provide stability and ownership to PGE, and entrust a board of our region's best and brightest, and I think Tom would be a great candidate to be on it, to guide the utility for the benefit and businesses here in Oregon. Imagine if we could actually debate the policies and programs associated with our utility because decisions were deliberated in a transparent manner in a public forum. Imagine if we could get off of this merry-go-round of utility sales and focus on how the utility should function for the next 10, 20, 50, and 100 years. Imagine if the board's fundamental obligation was to advance the long-term economic and community health of our region. Imagine that we could find the best private and public managers to run this utility. As we look back in history and guess, and that's all we can do is guess, at the future of a utility that has been up for sale repeatedly and is now proposed to go to an organization whose stated goal is to sell it again, I am confident that Oregonians would be better served if, we were, if PGE were publicly owned. Electricity is the backbone of our economy. When electric bills go up, companies choose to lo locate in other states, and that's been happening. When electric prices go up, employees at Blue Heron Paper and Intel lose their jobs, and that's happened. When electric prices go up, companies shelve their expansion plans, and when electric prices go up, families cannot pay their bills and have to make hard choices between food and clothing and electric bills. The benefits of public power are supported by extensive facts and data. They are very real. Over 35 million Americans in 2,000 communities obtain their electricity from publicly owned utilities. Many public utilities are out there and they provide excellent service at a lower price. A case in point is the Long Island Power Authority, which purchased its utility from Long Island Lighting Company about five years ago. The public ownership team in this case was able to save customers nearly $1 billion in the first two years. Even with rising energy costs, while PGE, P 
PGE's rates rose 35 percent, Long Island was able to reduce their rate, rates by 7 percent. Recently, the city of Portland asked an energy economist to calculate the rate impacts of a public purchase of PGE. The summary is on each of your tables, and his calculations were based on public filings. They concluded that a public purchase would save about 10% in rates. A 10% cost saving translates to about $100 million annually. That's $100 million every year back in our economy, helping families meet their bills, helping businesses expand and keep their employees. There are three very simple reasons for this advantage. The cost of debt is lower with the municipal bonds, the cost of equity is lower, and a public owner would not pay federal income taxes. Now, of course, Enron did not pay federal income taxes either, you're going to point out, <laughs> but, we would, but a, public, a public utility would not collect them. The 10% cost advantage is immediate and it's un unarguable. It's my opinion, and just my opinion, that closer to 15% could be achieved in the future with some things that aren't automatic. If energy costs were to go up, we would still have the advantage because the public cost benefit is driven purely by financial fundamentals. As important as rate reduction is, so is the stability of the company. Over the past years, the energy industry has changed dramatically. The, the focus is much more short term. Companies are required to maximize their, their returns to investors uh, to the greatest extent possible. That's a very good thing. It's the American way, and it's particularly good if you are Nike or Nordstrom and you have competitors who can keep your prices in check. But driving up costs on electricity is in direct conflict with the interests of all other Oregon businesses. PGE does not operate within a pure capitalist dynamic like most businesses. Not only does the government give it a monopoly, it guarantees it a return on its investments. We're never going to get back to the days when the Northwest cities and utilities had their hydroelectricity at the cheapest rates in the country. But why, I ask you today, would we pay more for electricity than we have to? Why would we choose to fatten the bank accounts of Fort Worth speculators at our own expense? It is time to bring this utility home. We need a utility that reflects the realities of history and the global economy of today. I'm excited by the possibilities of a global world. Oregon is more diverse, we're more interesting for it. We are very well positioned to grow new partnerships with Asia, with Europe, with Latin America, and with the rest of the world. Educated people are flocking here and we're changing every day. But as exciting as this world, new world can be, it is also quite daunting. As the world shrinks, local companies are disappearing, not just in Portland, but everywhere. Places like Oregon are in very real danger of having their essential infrastructure owned by outside interests. The old model, which both speakers today agreed worked very well, of a private, locally owned utility has faded from the picture. When faced with the situation, we need to adapt and build smart economic structures that retain control of the essential infrastructure here and allow us, Oregonians, to provide for basic needs in a sustainable fashion at the lowest possible cost. We should use private expertise and the available public tools to do it, and that's really what we're talking about. Private expertise, public tools, they're both available to us. Just for instance, can you imagine what the response would be if tomorrow the city of Portland announced that we were selling the Bull Run water system to Texas Pacific? If we lack the confidence and the wherewithal to recognize that continuing to have our electric company sold and resold may be good for a few executives and investors but bad for Oregonians, what does that say about us now? The Public Utility Commission can only rule on public benefit, not what might happen next. But they should hear from us loud and clear that if this proposal does not provide public benefit, we are confident that one can be brought forward that will. Regardless of which structure you prefer, and there's more than one, there's many, any system of public ownership has the same four common threads running through it. Lower rates, long-term ownership and stability, protection of the PGE employees, and a management team that puts Oregon's families and businesses first. Let's strip the Texas Pacific proposal to its basic. Its basics, its very basics, and it's not easy because there's a lot of people I respect involved in this. It's a new group of Texas speculators 
with the merest facade of local participation, is asking our permission to transfer $1 billion that belongs to Oregon's and Oregon and Oregon businesses to their pockets. $1 billion is the request that move out of the state over the next 10 years if we do this rather than the alternative. If we cannot say no to this, what do we stand for? There is no question in my mind we can build something better. It will work. We could prove once again to the world that Oregonians still have vision and we have the strength to do what is necessary to survive and prosper in this new world. Let's learn from the last century and do something new and exciting and smart in this one. If you agree with me, I, I, I would urge you to contact the PUC soon and let them know that you believe the Texas Pacific proposal should be denied. Thank you, Eric and Tom. Talk about uh, contrasting views. Uh, as you know, City Club members have the privilege of asking questions of our guests. Our first speak, our first questioner today, though, will be our board host, Tamsin Wassell. She's a member, uh, vice president of the City, uh, City Club's Board of Governors, and she's a partner at the management consulting firm Loyalty Path Associates. Following Tamsin's question, we will open the program to other City Club members. And in fact, while she's asking her question, please go ahead and line up behind the two microphones when it's your time to ask your question. Please ask a question, not a statement, a question in 30 seconds or less. Thank you. Good afternoon. There have been some concerns uh, during the debate of the public uh, power uh, conversations that we've had that a city-owned electric utility would not have the deep pockets to invest in the development of new supplies of power that we need for our future growth. Yet in light of the Tribune article today that suggests that Oregon Electric would withdraw funds from PGE over time, how can we be assured that either option will provide us with an electric power supply that can support the region's economic growth? Well, I, I think there's two pieces that are inherent in that. One is, can a public utility find the money to invest in the future, and then would it? And if you look historically, any utility is going to have to find capital to invest in new, in new generation and new transmission, all the things they do. And I am not, I want to be very clear on this, I have no interest in being involved in running PGE. I'm not qualified. But there's many qualified people here in this room. PGE has all kinds of investments it needs to make. If PGE had the same people planning those investments who are doing it now, but was underneath a public ownership structure, the money they borrowed to make those investments would be dramatically cheaper than the money that would be available to them under a private structure. So you could make those investments more cheaply. That's the, the, nobody has ever argued that municipal bonds aren't cheaper and that you don't need equity, which are two key financial advantages. The then next question is, which structure is more likely to look for the long term? And I believe that a company that knows it is not going to be sold whose mission is to deliver the best service possible and has no pressure whatsoever to create financial benefit for the capital that bought it from Texas is much more likely to make longer investments that don't pay back as quickly, which is what this utility needs. Eric is precisely right. Either form of ownership has significant investment requirements, um, totaling in the hundreds of millions of dollars over the next decade those funds will be provided under either form of ownership. At the end of the day, it's a call that this community has to make. Uh, there's not a perfect answer to it, but it's really a matter of choices. The thing we can all agree on is continuation of the Enron choice is beyond us. I would also argue that a spin to the creditors in no way serves the purposes of this community. As many of you know, a year and a half ago, I spent a considerable amount of time, and pleasurably so with Eric, looking at the kind of model that he suggests. Time simply didn't serve that effort well. The creditors of Enron refused to negotiate with the city of Portland about a purchase. We can condemn their actions for that, but those were facts. The opportunity that existed for public ownership uh, in a, an extraordinary fashion came to light during the bankruptcy process and was prompted by the rules of the bankruptcy court, uh, the federal rules, and specifically those were after the offer that was made by TPG, 
which was made in November and accepted by the creditors, the bankruptcy court set in process an option for anyone, public or private, to top that bid by a, near, by a mere 2%. In essence, she could step in to the same structure TPG had negotiated with Enron, including the identification and isolation um, of all the vast array of liabilities, and for a price certain, not through condemnation, but at a price certain, purchase that asset at the bankruptcy court in an auction that took place at the end of January. No other entity, public or private, stepped forward to do that. That opportunity doesn't come again. This entity is now on its way out of bankruptcy. There are two options literally before us. One is as structured and potentially restructured by the Oregon Public Utility Commission to enter into a transaction with Oregon Electric or to spin PGE to the creditors. The creditors number in total about 200,000. They're controlled by a creditors committee of 50. Uh, we, none of those are in, in Oregon to the best of my knowledge, certainty, progression, assurance of investment in the expansion of the PGE system will not, in my judgment, come about by a spin to the creditors. Ray Polani, a City Club member, a long time City Club member. And I remember this issues being here before, a public utility district. And I remember a lot of PGE people being here, and uh, we know what the result was. The thing that we must remember paramount is that PGE is a public utility, public utility. It should have access to public power, and I think the crucial question is, how about benefits and profits to the public? I, my point in the speech, which I think was pretty straightforward, is that the, the PUC should not approve this unless there's public benefit. And there is an application into the PUC, and it offers nothing in terms of rate reduction or anything else that, that's different at this point. And so I, I cannot see what the public benefit is. As I see the process, and Tom, Tom kind of lapsed off the question, so I'm going to do it just a little bit right now. The first time that an Oregon body has the opportunity to inject Oregon's opinion into the Enron bankruptcy is the PUC. I think Tom is making predictions that if Enron's decision, Enron's decision to sell the company to another Texas company, who I think they were always more comfortable with, if you want to know the truth, all along than they would be with something out of our state, is denied. He's guessing that the Enron creditors will decide they're going to keep the stock. That's far from determined. I think the Texas Pacific company bid is what needs to be looked at to see whether or not, as Ray calls for, there is public benefit in it. If there is not, the PUC should absolutely, under no circumstances, take the position that they think the creditors might do something. My suspicion is if the public offered the same amount of money that Texas Pacific has offered to the creditors, the day after the PUC turned them down, that they would look very long and hard at that, particularly because it would not need regulatory approval, because public public utilities don't have to prove they're going to give money back like, like this one does and has not, has not committed to do. Ray, your point, uh, PGE historically has been a public utility, and what we have in time-honored tradition in the Pacific Northwest, all accepted is we will either have privately owned profit-making utilities that are appropriately regulated, or we will have publicly owned entities, and we have both. And if you look across the landscape of the Northwest, we have both models, and they are both successful. The choice that exists today is which one do we want, and I have a fundamental disagreement with Eric. We don't have a choice today through a clear path to return, not to return, to achieve public ownership for PGE. That opportunity went by during the bankruptcy process. The option that is open today, if we want public ownership of PGE, is condemnation, and that is the only option. Uh, Justin Gottlieb, City Club member. The one thing that I'm kind of thinking about right now is you both have invoked an argument of pro-Portland, pro-Oregon. Have you thought about uh, public-private 
partnership in owning PGE. The public manages, uh, Texas Pacific ends up putting up investment capital, or anything along those lines as opposed to the either or argument. I, I, my personal opinion is that, uh, and I'm speaking for myself today, the council hasn't taken a position on, the, on whether the PUC should approve this or not. Um, my personal position is that the best model for Oregon would be a publicly owned utility that was then privately run. Um, some people don't agree with that, but that's my own position. And I actually would recommend something like the exact people that run it now with a board that looks a lot like Oregon Electric, only it would be permanent and have control. Um, Bill Parrish, who's in the audience, has suggested using PERS funds to finance that and keep it here rather than rather than having PERS funds finance Texas Pacific. If I read this application right, and I didn't put it in my speech um, because I'm not 100% I'm sure, but I'm 90% sure this application says that the Oregon Electric Board cannot reduce rates without Texas Pacific's permission. And so I would actually tap people like Tom, people like Neil Goldschmidt, people like Peggy Fowler, like the PG management team, have them run the utility, but rather than have it financed at a very expensive cost by a Texas Pacific group, have us finance it ourselves as Oregonians, save $100 million and let them do their job, $100 million per year. I think a lot of us have thought about the alternative model, which is to not make it particularly complicated. How do you have public ownership, really enlightened governance, and the best of private management? And that is an ideal solution. And I started with Eric about 18 or 19 months ago, thinking creatively how we could bring that about. I confess that my brain grew smaller, and I never came up with the model. It doesn't just say it doesn't exist. And I wouldn't forecast that it doesn't exist, but it's not a template that is um, in use someplace else in the country that we could suddenly um, adapt. The potential for it is there um, if the efforts which Eric, with enormous energy and insight and supported by his, uh, his city council, pursued, uh, had had the opportunity to negotiate a transaction with the creditors, we might have fleshed that out and we might have found it. Um, at the end of the day, we'd have all been well served if we could have. But one of the things I continually come back to in my own activities is what I wish for is often different than what I can actually do. And at the end of the day, when opportunities um, pass me by, with regret, I recognize that they have passed me by, and then I move on to take the best advantage of the opportunities that remain for me. The kinds of conversations Eric and I had a year and a half ago, would that sort of creative, nowhere yet seen model possibly exist was infinitely in intriguing. But as the world moved along, the answers didn't come forth. That brought us to the, to the fall, late summer and fall of 2003. The creditors were ready to enter into a transaction. TPG was the only one there ready, willing, able, and funded sufficiently to enter into that transaction. As I looked across all the options, I thought it was the very, very best option available to all of us in this community to bring PGE home, to put the Enron chapter behind us, to restore things, not exactly in the way that we've always done them, but in the best choice that was available for us today. Cy Cornbrook City Club member. I want to preface this question, the fact that I live on the east side and I am a PPL customer and so that it doesn't actually affect me. But it does affect people who have had uh, PG, PGE. Is Texas Pacific willing to say yes or no to the fact, the guarantee, the people who use PGE will have a rate reduction? No, Texas Pacific and Oregon Electric are not prepared to make that commitment. Meredith Savory, member. Uh, it's a question for Eric. Eric, what's the process to get from where we are now uh, to where you want to be? Uh, could you be more, more specific about it? Sure. Um, I don't want to put Tom, words in Tom's mouth, but he, he's saying, gosh, this other model would be great if you could get there. So if that's true, and he'll jump in if it's not, then the question is, can we get there? The way things work now, and 
it, it, Tom is absolutely right. It was not possible to do something more creative with Enron. Their comfort level was selling it to Texas Pacific, which I'm not saying is similar in, in any of the hijinks that, that Enron does, but is, is, a, is a Texas firm that is in the same circles as those executives. It was a lot easier sale to them. The fact that there was no other model on the table is not true. Um, Enron made a decision to sell it to Texas Pacific. The bankruptcy court approved that. At this point, the Public Utility Commission is only obligated to approve that if it believes that there is benefit. Traditionally, benefit means reductions in rates. That's not on the table. Sometimes benefits means something else for the community. There is nothing on the table at this point. The path would be the PUC says no to this transaction, at which point Enron has to go back to their creditors and say this was not approved. At that point, this community could and should come forward with an offer equal or better than Texas Pacifics and say to those creditors, you're willing to sell it for this amount, this amount is back on the table and it could be, it can be closed in a time period faster than the, than the PUC would have approved this anyway. That's the simple approach. And I believe that if this community came together and rather than saying, we're stuck, Enron screwed us, so let's just take the best we can get. We all came together and said, let's make that better model happen, block the Texas Pacific deal at the PUC, Enron's going to sell the company to, for the same amount of money, and it's, it's eminently possible. And the idea that Oregonians ought to have to settle is not in the tradition of this state. In the opportunity, just repeat my earlier point, the opportunity that the city had to do that was at the overbid process in the bankruptcy court. That was the end of January 2004. That opportunity has passed us by. It won't come again. The city did not think getting into a bidding war for, for this company was in anyone's interest, the employees, the ratepayers, anybody else. We also, and I want to be very clear about this, I did not give this speech in January because Texas Pacific had not made its proposal. I was open to the idea that Texas Pacific was going to bring benefit to our state. If you get this proposal, that's when I came to the conclusion that it ought to be turned down. So the reason we didn't act in January was because we had a very, very open mind. And I felt that the right place to decide whether or not the Texas Pacific proposal was good was not at the city council, but at the PUC, which is where it is now. And it's only after I saw what Texas Pacific was proposing that I concluded that I was opposed to it. Uh, <clears throat> Ned Look, member, I was concerned that neither of the speakers mentioned the role of the past PGE president, who resigned, left here, became a board member of Enron in Houston, had his offices in the headquarters of Enron. Is there anything we learned from the fact that he is now in Eastern Oregon, or we think he's in Eastern Oregon, growing grapes with an $75 million pay, uh, payment uh, for his services. Is there anything that should concern us about that, or is there anything that we learn from that that we could be guarding against? Both of you. <laughs> well, the things we learn uh, from that is when cowboys like Enron come to town, we ought to graciously say, welcome, and the next train leaves in an hour. Why don't you go back? Um, um, that is that simple. Uh, the specific individual you're referring to, um, personally, was a longtime friend and a supporter of things I've tried to work on in this community. The PGE board in 1997 made a fundamental mistake. You just you can't get around that. I would say to everybody sitting here, if I had been in the unfortunate position of sitting on that board, I don't think I'd have been smart enough to see the crooks from Enron. They were world-class fraud artists. End of, end of story. They just, um, they took us for a ride. Uh, as Eric has said, a number of them are, are on their way to jail now, and a few more are probably standing in line to buy their tickets. Um, you know, Enron was, terrible, but again, Enron is not the problem uh, anymore, and Ken Harrison is not the problem. The problem is you have a financial structure in which large companies 
buy up small local companies. And if the PGE board hadn't made the decision to do it in 1997, they would have made it down the road because just about all of their peers are, and they have an economic responsibility to their shareholders. My argument is not for things like restaurants and Nikes and Nordstrom's and things that are competitive, but things that are basic life-giving infrastructure owned by monopolies. Given that the days of local private companies owning these types of utilities are gone, they don't exist anymore, it makes more sense to own them publicly locally and hire private management to run them because Ken Harrison did what a CEO would do in that situation, which is, is maximize the value. And that's what Texas Pacific will do with this company in five to seven years, as sure as the sun will come up. We've reached our normal uh, uh, closing time. It's 1.15, so what I'd like to suggest is that I'll officially close the meeting. Uh, the comments probably won't be recorded, but we can stick or have those who want to stay around, stay around for the few questions. I think there are four more questioners I see up here. One, two, three, four. And so for those who'd like to stick around, and if our guests are willing, we'll take those last four questions. But for the rest of you, we're officially adjourned. Thanks. Five. Okay, we'll make it five. <laughs> All right, but that'll be it. So those of you who need to go, uh, we're officially adjourned, but th let's take the question from Bob Shoemaker. Uh, Bob Shoemaker, member, and uh, I came in a little bit late, so maybe this has been answered, but uh, Tom, I haven't heard a rebuttal of the turnaround charge that in five to seven years, Oregon Electric will be gone and the ownership of PGE will be sold to the highest bidder, whoever, wherever that entity might be. Could you respond to, uh, to that? Certainly. The five to seven years uh, has been speculated about, but is not cast in stone in any way. What is cast in stone is that the way that Texas Pacific Group structures their funds, and this is at the, the request and the requirement of pension funds like Oregon's who invest with them, is that there is a finite life of those funds, which is 12 years. All of the capital committed to any one of the Texas Pacific Group funds by states like Oregon, like California, like New York, must be returned to the pension funds in 12 years. What that means is that an investor like TPG needs to exit its investment before that time. It's been speculated that that would be five to seven years. I have said in all the conversations I've had with Neil, with Jerry, 